This session is brought to you by Zurich Life and Investments. These guys are one of the last true independent life insurers going around and they're Swiss, so you know their stuff is solid. These guys really understand and believe in the value of advice, which is why they invest in programs like this one and partner with groups like XY Advisor to help drive the positive evolution of financial advice in Australia. Their team are just really good people as well. So if you haven't already connected with them to learn more, check out their website or speak to your business development contact. This session is also brought to you by Sun Super. They're one of the fastest growing profit for members or industry funds in Australia. They were the very first of these funds to partner with advisors and they've got functionality where you can actually link to your client's Sun Super accounts and charge advice fees through the fund, as well as a number of uh, tech innovations to make it easier for you to work with your clients. They've got great investments, they're really, really cheap, and their team are just generally legends. So if you haven't already connected with Sun Super, give them a shout, because they're doing some really cool stuff. Neil Rogan from Centuria Investment Funds. How are you doing? I'm well, Adrian. What's How happening? You, Clayton. I'm very good, mate, very good. We've, uh, we've, we're in our our new studio. So this is this is a bit fancier than the previous one. We've got Audrey with us behind us. So it's nice of her to attend. Yep. You're looking. She's looking like she's sipped from the fountain of youth, mate. Oh, she's timeless. <laughs> she's timeless. It's just a bit like Clayton. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> so um, Clay was telling me there's something about like a bit of a torch relay that happened at some point. Yes, well, many years ago, um, when you were probably, when your parents were probably watching <laughs> ALF and you were standing up in your cot, I, um, I was lucky enough to... In be, 2000. <laughs> yeah, <I was laughs> probably a teenager, definitely a teenager. Yeah, yeah but looked like an adult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and still standing in your cot. Yeah, yeah haven't changed since. Oh, you had your racing car bed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, let's not even joke about how much I wanted one of them. Still would. Oh, my God. So I was lucky enough to work at AMP during that time, and it was pre-social media and pre a lot of the, the social media that we have today. And um, I was responsible for the um, marketing of the AMP Torch Relay. Okay. And, and part of that was how we positioned financial advisors in their local community and mm. using the Torch Relay as an asset. And so many of the advisors who, who couldn't get into clubs or schools and those kinds of things were able to use something like the Olympics as a property to, to build their businesses. Okay. And I'm well, sure... So, like, because they're a part of, like, the journey, how it goes around Australia. That's right. That's 183 it. locations. Wow. Because I know at the bottom of the AMP building in uh, uh, down at Circular Quay, they've got the historical... They've got a whole lot of them, like ones from, like, 1954 when I was in Melbourne and that sort of thing. They're... The Wall of Torches. Yes, the Wall of Torches. Yeah. So was it successful? Well, I think so. I think... Yeah, it was very successful, only because, you know, the advisors who who were in the location where the torch went were mm. able to, they had this big party that was branded AMP when the flame came into town. So so you just got to do a rolling party from no, one town to the next. No, I didn't. <laughs> the Neil Rogan party bus. No, it was around how we, how we, <laughs> the advisor was always the hero. Ah, uh, but the did you advisor. did you at some point get to run with it? No. Oh, <laughs> always the bridesmaid, it? never the bridesmaid. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. A bit like investment bonds. <laughs> <laughs> They're coming into their own. They're coming into their own. Now. They caught always the bouquet. Fighting. Always with fighting. the legislation, they just caught the bouquet. <laughs> always <laughs> fighting super. <laughs> Oh. So, so the AMP advisors they did they do did they come out with like a new fee schedule that said like uh, gold, silver, and bronze sort of thing? Or like... I really can't remember. Adrian <laughs> it was, it was a long time ago. I would have gotten pretty corny, I reckon, with that whole thing. Like sort of <laughs> could have gone down to Coogee. Came to Coogee. Yeah, that would have been good. I was still. I wasn't could you at that time, so I missed out. But you, you were in your cot still, mate. Yeah, so it's tell us racing cut bed. <laughs> <laughs> tell us a little bit about these um, these investment bonds, mate, because there's been mm. a lot of there's been a lot of conversation on the group, and when I say a lot, I mean it was one post, but there was a lot of comments on the post. 
um, about how to use bonds, are they worthwhile? Uh, and and funnily enough, this was all happening at a at a point where um, Adrian was learning about bonds individually. Mm. Oh. And um, and we were discussing the pros and cons. Um, and so I, I'd like to talk, I guess, let's start off really high level, mm-hmm. right? Um, what is a bond mm-hmm. and why would a, an advisor use one? Mm-hmm. So if you think about your clients, there are probably – uh, three buckets of money or three buckets where they can put their money. So they can put their money into superannuation. Um, they can, that's, you know, a tax effective structure, probably one of the, the most tax effective structures you could ever have to invest in for, for the long term. Um, and then other clients may have something like a, a trust with a company type structure. Yep. And that may be a common thing that you come across. Uh, where distributions get paid out or, or however. Doing loans on those things, it's an interesting paper trail you got to follow. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. When I talk about this, I say, who here in the room has got a family trust and who keeps all the documents in their cupboard, you know, and they open the door and go, there's a trust. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shut the door again. Um, and then, um, and then you know, there's something like an investment bond where the, the structure... Um, you can have any any assets in the structure, yep. and it's a tax paid structure paid at the the company tax rate. So mm. super a company. I mean, technically, you could have it in your own name. That's right, depending on your marginal tax rate. Yep, and mm. then and then you've got this other pretend in between world where we don't quite understand how it works, and that's called bond, and it's it's half. It's half super, half own name, basically. Uh, insurance. It's an insurance <clears throat> bond. Yeah, it's technically an in- insurance policy. Um, so it sits it's within the, the APRA. life insurance legislation. So that's it's, right. it's almost like a legacy product or legacy legislation, I should say. Cause it, it, and it is legislation, isn't it? Because, well, because, because it, it sits under the Life Act. Yes. So yeah. It sits yes. within the life <clears throat> act as a as a life insurance policy. So you get the benefits of having a life policy with the equivalent of a managed fund sitting beneath mm. it. And 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 then so what companies like Centuria and and all the other bond providers they uh, have used this uh, uh, legislation under the life act mm-hmm. to say actually there's a much better way that we can use this structure than how it was used in the past. That's right. I mean, that, and that's what I was getting at. When I yeah. say legacy, it was le- it's legacy, but it's been taken advantage of more now. That's true. Many of these structures, um, you know, I'll call them a, t- a tried and tested structure that have really, they've really stood the test of time in that they existed prior to superannuation even mm. existing. Yeah, well. And a lot of people, a lot of our clients, um, Use these as a savings mechanism when um, when super wasn't around. So, mm. some clients now who've been our client for over 30, 35 years, some of our clients have still they're still live and they do a partial withdrawal allow their their investment bond to to live off or mm. to supplement their age pension and those kinds of things. So, so you're right, Clayton. These things existed, um, you know, decades ago. Um, even before the torch relay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is and, this the big bang? <laughs> and then, and then um, what? What you know, people like us, companies like ourselves, have done is really put more contemporary investment options beneath them, right? Mm. That that suit the needs of investors today. So you can have everything from a cash fund all the way through to a you know a higher growth. And, fund and, and in that case, it's exactly like super. You can have whatever you want in there. Yep. Yeah. Except, Ooh. except, oh, whatever Neil allows to go in there. Okay. Except, you know, in 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 many cases, well, there is a, a piece of tax legislation or tax law that um, that doesn't allow the investor to control the assets. So, mm. you okay, don't get the, so you can't have. It's like what it's I the arm's call, length rule in the superannuation shop. Sure. You can't have what I would call an SMSF style bond. Sure. Yeah. So you won't. We won't see direct equity choices within. Investment bonds. Unlikely. Okay. In the works, though. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> maybe one day. <laughs> well, the, um, the th- 
I guess the, the thing around um, investment funds is that they, like a lot of people are struggling to net off all the different components because there's a, a few extra levels of complexity there. Yep. Because you've got the legislation, you've got the rules, you've got the, um, you've got the tax and mm-hmm. the way it's calculated. Yes. And then you've got, um, I guess, the investment returns and the net fees after, mm-hmm. before, after fees, all that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of variables that come in. And I think some of the conversations in the XY Advisor have been people um, struggling sometimes or advisors struggling to really get to the core and try to understand it like an investment bond relative to if, if you're just looking at a simpler context and not looking at some of these state planning benefits and the more yep. creative stuff, mm-hmm. if you're going investment versus investment and going, okay, well, if I did this in super, if I did this in a mm-hmm. bond, what are, what's the different outcomes? Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, Well, if you're looking, let's, 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 look, let's go back to the client because I always like to start with the, the clients. If you've got clients who are wanting to grow their wealth, and they may want to grow their wealth outside of superannuation savings. Mm-hmm. And so they're that they may have a number of choices. But if you've got clients who are potentially on the highest marginal tax rate or on a, on a tax rate that's over 30 cents in the dollar, mm-hmm. um, it may be worth considering a bond as part of that mix because the investment bond is paying tax on behalf of the investor at a maximum rate of 30%. Now, yep. with franking credits that the fund may may receive and and um, management expenses, that effective rate may reduce because, mm-hmm. because you know, uh, um, they're deductible against the fund. So the investor gets a net return on an annual basis. So what, what would be the... After fees and taxes. If an advisor was going to go look for, to try and sort of really get the net outcome for clients, what would you suggest they, to, to simplify it for them, what should mm-hmm. they be looking for, which type of figure should they be, they be looking to compare to get a more effective sort of assessment when they're <laughs> looking at different bonds? Because, like, I don't, like do, do the different bond providers um, calculate things differently? Well, I mean, they all we all pay tax at the corporate rate. Yeah. So we all pay tax at the – and most of us are all linked to the – you know, we're all linked to the, the company tax rate, which is, which is reducing over, mm-hmm. over the next couple of years. Um, so over time, that effective rate will reduce, but it will depend on the assets that are being held within each each fund yep. or each investment option within those bonds to understand what the real tax rate is. So, so is that because advice, it's calculated differently depending on the asset? Or that's right, yep. depending on if you've got international assets in there. Yeah. You know, so you're getting you international may, tax credits and things like that coming that's in. That's right. And, yep. And so that may that may create a variable around what the tax rate is. Mm-hmm. So, so for advisors who are wanting to make a comparison, they probably need to look at uh, look at it on a fund by fund basis to see what what the effective tax rate. Mm-hmm. And you know, I'll give ourselves a plug here. On our mm-hmm. fact sheets, we quote the effective tax rate yep. for our funds. So on our website, um, we've got the effective tax rate. And often that that's a lot lower because of like the offset of costs. <coughs> costs and, yeah. and, franking and franking credits. So that credits, can yeah. be that can be, you know, as low as into the low twenties or mm-hmm. or into the high teens, depending on, on what assets are sitting within within those funds. So so that's a that's something, you know, advisors could do as a as a comparison. The other thing that is around whether they're comparing net return with net return, yep, um, or gross return with gross return, and and you know um, the the investors then paying provisional tax on on any earnings and things. Yep, and then and in terms of I guess like when you're playing around with uh, I guess all the rules in terms of entry and um, the restrictions around how much additional can go yep. into it. Um, I suppose, I suppose for people out there, we might as well go into them because yep. we, let's not just assume that everyone knows what these no, are. No, and I'll try and simplify yeah, it for everyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so there's, you know, there's no minimum that can go in, no maximum, sorry, the minimum that we have in our bonds is, is $500 as, mm-hmm. a, as an entry or, um, but there is no maximum amount that can be put into a bond within the first year. So yep. with super... As an example, you may be capped around what can go in as a non-concessional contribution, mm-hmm. um, and there may be limits around what you can put in, um, 
you know, once you reach certain thresholds. Yep. So, so with an investment bond in the first year, there is no limit on what you can put in. And at the end of the year, it locks. That's right. On the policy anniversary, yeah, um, it does. I don't want to say lock, but that's a, that's a harsh word, Adrian. Ooh, it's the effect. <laughs> that, that we put a latch on it. Yes. <laughs> and then and then in the second year, you can contribute 125% of your first year's contribution yep. and so on, you know, for the for the subsequent years. Yeah, and if, if in the second year you only contribute 80% of the first year's contribution, you can only contribute... 125% of that 80%. That's right. Is that right? So it will reset each, each year, year and depending on what – so if you're not continuing to keep it at the maximum, you're going to reduce the potential contribution over the 10 years. That's right. And if you pause um, your contributions and you may want to restart them, um, you, know, you could just open another bond. Mm. But in doing so, restarting the 10-year – Yeah, but you've still okay. got the one that you already true, have. True. So and and just so change. everyone out there, like the 10-year rule is probably one of the key pivotal decisions. That's right. Comes into play. So, uh, <laughs> so the 10-year rule is that, you know, if you hold the the investment bond for, for 10 years mm -hmm. and you make a withdrawal after the 10th anniversary, yep. there's no personal tax obligations that you need to make on the growth component of the of that. And withdrawal. I think this is where sometimes people get a bit confused with the terminology because it's it's not tax free, it's tax paid. That's right. We've paid tax on behalf of the investor mm -hmm. all the way through and um, they don't have to withdraw all the money at the 10th year. They can make a partial withdrawal. Mm -hmm. But when they make that partial withdrawal or full withdrawal in the 10th year, yeah, there's no personal tax obligation that they need to make on, on any of the growth of mm -hmm. those assets. Now, if they withdraw in the 8th and 9th years, mm -hmm. um, any of the growth component is taxed in the eighth year at two thirds mm -hmm. of the investor's marginal rate. Yep. Bearing in mind that we've already paid thirty percent tax for them, so mm. it's the differential between the thirty percent and their marginal rate. Yep. Um, and then, but two thirds of that, and then in the ninth year, or going leading to the tenth anniversary. It's then one third of the yep. investor's marginal rate. So yeah, you, if you if you're before the ninth, the eighth year, you sort of you're really avoiding the benefit quite a bit. Yeah, that's right. But it does have other benefits where you could assign the policy to someone who's on a on not on a, any kind of mm. not paying any tax, and they can make a withdrawal up to the thirty cents in the dollar. Yeah. So yep. this is this is where you get into the flexibility of it. Yep. Yeah, because we're playing outside of. Uh, I guess the CIS legislation. That's right. So we're not, which is quite a, I guess, um, prescriptive That's legislation right. that puts um, very clear parameters around what you can do with super. That's right. And yes. um, arguably the beauty of, I guess, investment bonds is that they have been left alone by government for a lot of, a number of years. Like when was the last time there was a legislative change that impacted an investment bond? Well, the main one was linking to the link, linking the corporate rate with the life companies, and that would have okay. been in the early two thousands. That's probably okay. the major. So, what was it before? What? Well, some of them, some life companies didn't pay any tax. Uh, there was different gotcha. tax. So, so the corporate rate was linked to the to to the to legislation, the so requirement. Okay. And then um, that's probably the the major one, but. Yeah, so you're not much to relative say, to super, eh? Yeah, yeah, no, very. I so mean, do you find that like people, that's what people, some people like about it? I guess that stability of government impact on. Well, I think yeah, there's there's really a couple of things that that show well that may demonstrate that the regulatory risk around any change to these things is is potentially quite low, and that's because we are paying tax on mm. behalf of the investor, and we're clear. What, what tax we are paying, mm -hmm. like each benefit fund that we have has its own P&L, yep. you know, and all those kinds of things. The tax rate is clear. Mm -hmm. um, we're encouraging uh, investors to save outside of super, which well, is... Well, the, the nature and the way it's designed encourages those contributions. Exactly. Because otherwise, you'll, you won't be able to... And long-term savings. Yep. Um, and so those two things combined, I think, show that potentially the regulatory risk around any kind of change may be low. Um, but then there's also the estate planning benefits. Yes. Well, 
Yes, and there's uh, <laughs> some good, some interesting stuff there. And like, again, the CIS legislation, outside of that, you don't have the restrictions on beneficiaries. That's right. And, you know, we find in these days that most, in many cases, there are a lot of blended families or we find that there's a lot of grandparents who love their grandchildren more than their children and you'd mm. see this as a financial advisor almost every day mm -hmm. that they say, well, we don't want, you know, our, our, the proceeds from our savings or what it may be to go to our children because they're getting the house or they're yep. getting our super or something like that. But, you know, we want this kind of money to be used, you know, as a nest egg for our grandchildren. Well, something like an investment bond, you know, sits outside the will. Mm. And, you know, they can nominate a, a beneficiary and... Yeah, and so similar, like, I guess for people to, like, it's it's like superannuation. If you go binding nomination to a spouse, et cetera, the trustee of the fund has to send the money there and it's bypassing the will. That's right. Bypasses the estate and it's paid, um, tax paid to the estate mm. as well. So there's no... So the net tax outcome can potentially be a lot less than... It would be otherwise. That's and right. arguably, um, I guess that would be for some, depending on people's situations, for the older clients, um, yeah, it can make a big difference. Yeah, it can be seen as very attractive for, for some people, particularly, as I said, if they've got very complicated family arrangements or... Or, or, or they just want certainty around their well, estate now. Yeah, I think, like, I guess the thing around the will is that the challenge aspect um, is still in play. So as much as you can put an ironclad will together or, mm. like, as ironclad as possible with a great lawyer, the, the ability to challenge a will is still there. And, yeah, like, it's it's just in place. And and I think that's that's one of the risks that, um, I guess people went with estate planning are always coming up against. If there is a certain history of um, relationships or um, closeness to certain people that may not be getting um, a, being a beneficiary of the will, hmm. you're automatically having creating a situation that, especially if it's um, uh, from my perspective and my understanding, is that this perspective especially if this hasn't been in place for a long time. So if the will's set in place in a short period of time before and there's been no infrastructure that sort of specifies um, that money isn't going to people for a number, a period of time, you've got a high risk of, um, of something happening. Now, I wonder, I'm just curious around, because of the flexibility of changing beneficiaries, mm. is that maybe would that still get caught up in that potential... I know we're going into a, quite a legal area, but um, I don't know. Have you seen anything that um, where like someone switched the beneficiary of a of a bond, for example, Re like in the eight year eighth year mark or something like that? And then... um, no, I, I can't say. I've seen I've seen much of. I haven't. Uh, I must say, I haven't really seen any of that in the in my time at, okay. at Centuria. It's it, that. Oh, because all the clients just get their, ben their yeah. benefits straight away. That's straight true. Away. They are proof of death, you know, death certificate we, we, we pay out. So, the, you know, the, I'll call it variation of beneficiaries. So you can hold a bond for a day and then, you know, pass away and, and you know, the funds will pass directly to that beneficiary. So another question that we get asked mm. is, you know, does the bond need to be in place for 10 years before... And yep. if someone dies, do the do the beneficiaries get the money? Well, you know, if I died tomorrow, my beneficiaries and I had a bond. Well, I do have a bond, but you know, my beneficiaries will will get uh, the proceeds of that bond. Um, so you could you could um, start out day yeah. one. You've got a bond with one beneficiary. Day three, you're like, geez, I I really don't feel the same way about that person. I'm going to pick another beneficiary, <laughs> and you can do that. And submit a form and it's swapped. Yep. And then day four, you cark it and that other person gets the... Mm-hmm. Okay. That's lucky for that other person, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Neil, one other area that I find really interesting is that from my grasp of the market around this space, there, there seems to be a bit of flexibility with certain tax rulings as well, that there's the standard investment bond structure, but I've noticed that there's other certain variations 
of the investment bond where certain rulings around education have been made. Oh, okay, yeah. So, well, so is this is this a place where the I guess the regulator or the government's allowing a bit of creativity for, like, if you if you came up with a, a way a structure that achieved a certain um, I guess government interested outcome and you put it forward to the government for approval within this framework. Like, and the example I'm talking about is the is approvals for education bonds, which mm. end up being not just tax paid, but tax rebated. Is this something that like, if you guys came up with something that aligned with the public interest, uh, you could put forward a case to, to get a ruling. Is this something that's, uh, Oh, it's a little more. I'll be. I'll be honest with you. It's probably a bit more complicated than that. Oh, okay, <laughs> but maybe but I'm just being a bit sound, idealistic. It does so. sound. Um, <laughs> you know, I think any any kind of structure that that it helps people save more money, either you know, inside you know, for their retirement or for for deferred consumption down the track, any kind mm. of government you know assistance that encourages that is a good thing. Mm. Um, then on the flip side, anything where the government enables um, education, being the father of two boys who are of school age, anything that encourages um, you know, your education costs to be more tax effective is also a good thing given mm. you know, the, the pressures of, of, of living you know, in a big city. So I think you know, any kind of public policy that supports that is mm. is helpful, and how we design products around that, and yeah. the nuances of those products, yeah. is also is also good a good thing. It's more ensuring that you know with with advisors and also with clients they know what they're buying, mm. and because it know, is not a simple product. yeah it's not yeah, yeah in in those instances they yeah. know what they're buying yeah. and and it's clear around what they're getting. In mm. our case. You know, we don't we don't have an education fund. I'll be I'll be honest with you, but you know we've got a savings plan that that you know once after ten years you know can withdraw and the money can be used for anything. So in in some of those cases there are restrictions around um, how the funds can be applied. Yep. You know, like you mightn't be able to use the money. You know, to pay for to your travel kids. to South America. Yeah, for your kids to have a gap year, which is, which <laughs> I'd argue that's pretty educational. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, the I've got some friends who's who's um, both of the, two of my close friends. Their their children just did the HSC last year, and both of their children are having a gap year now. As as you know, kind of middle aged people <laughs> trying to fund a gap year on top of everything else yep. for for. For a couple of kids is is an expensive exercise. Yeah. So they've told them to go work. Is that yeah, right? partly <laughs> work, <laughs> work and work and some parental assistance. I think so. But having something like this would be able to you know a defer uh, where you're deferring consumption. You've got tax effective structure to invest in that gives you flexibility around how you can use the money. Is mm. something that you know may be seen as an attractive option for some people. So if we if we had a few creative minds in XY Advisor come up with like a, a concept that aligned with the public interest, had great investment outcomes, would we, we, we might be able to put it to you, Neil, and go to go to um, the minister and say, uh, we've got this new product that would be really cool and it hits all these public interest targets and is really tax effective. Um, we've actually taken the requirement for company tax out of it. Um, <laughs> Would we have much of a chance at that one, though? You never know what's possible. <laughs> if you don't you, ask, you, you don't. don't get. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, if anyone's listening, maybe post on the group and see what you can come up with. That's a... <laughs> Always open to ideas. You know, any any kind of um, product idea, you know, we don't have a market without, without the support of advisors. So um, if we're not building what advisors want and need, well, then we don't, we don't have a business. Yeah, that's very cool. So I'm, I'm interested. I think one thing that really cl- would clarify a lot of the, I guess, the estate planning area of investment bonds, is like some of the the risks and what what you've what you've either seen directly or seen mm. through, um, I guess, your team. Yep. Experiences of um, where a bonds protected or where not having this sort of structure. Um, and this, these mechanisms 
mm. has meant a really adverse outcome for clients and yeah. Yeah, so. I mean my only my only caution would be for advisors in New South Wales. There's a there's a thing in New South Wales called notional estate. Mm-hmm. And I'm not gonna go into it here, but yep. but you know, in, in any kind of estate planning it's the catch all, isn't it? Yes, it's something that that I would say um you know, as advisors, it's it's being aware of that. But in every other state in Australia, that doesn't exist. Okay. And and so it's pretty clear cut where you've got a if you've got an investment bond with a beneficiary nominated or you know that kind of thing, where where proceeds can go. So New South Wales would the catch all would still apply to an investment bond. Potentially, yes. So registering the bond in a location that you might have another office in in another state may be helpful to um, achieving the interests of the client. Yeah, I know. In speaking to some, and it might be worthwhile getting an estate planning lawyer yes. on to talk about <laughs> yeah. national estate totally. because I know in, in in some cases um, for, for, for very high net worth people um, who have complicated family arrangements, often they get retired into a different state mm. <laughs> to avoid to avoid some of the issues that sit around notional estates. So mm. I'll park that there. Yeah, it's it's a bit <laughs> of a um, and do a minefield, lead in. you might say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and do a lead in for another couple of, a couple of amateurs talking about estate planning. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's probably not a good thing. <laughs> So, Neil, what if we did this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not retiring to South Australia, Adrian. You're not going to retire me to South Australia. Well, I was thinking the Seychelles or um, Gibraltar, Gibraltar or something. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> they got really good um, tax planning over there. Uh, so, so in terms of, um, I guess, what about the investment side of things? So... Is there anything that any restrictions on sort of that makes it challenging to get certain exposures in or could, um, I know we're going to be talking about uh, Bitcoin, there's uh, any managed, any unitized vehicle could essentially be plugged into uh, an investment bond platform? Is that? Yeah, pretty much. Um, Yeah, it's being able to be able to strike a, a unit price for, for, for investors. Um, each, each investment option in in most cases in in most providers has a set of um, benefit fund rules and those rules are, are, are they've been registered with APRA they've been reviewed by a um, by an, uh, each each life company's appointed actuary and um, and they're publicly available mm-hmm. if the investor wants to look at them or if an advisor wants to look at them that information is publicly available and that in those rules it gives a set of ranges around you know what what the fund can invest in so is there limits on gearing um, well it depends on the rules of each fund okay well, so and and whether those rules have been approved or not in I don't think in any of ours we we have any gearing but but in other in other providers, they may have. So it's a possibility. Yeah, in it may be it may be, um, and you'd have to look at their their products to un, to to see that. But um, you know, uh, they can they can have that as long as you know they've got coverage or whatever the rules meets, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah meets, meets, the the, meets their meets the requirements of the regulator. Because mm. it all has to get signed off and reviewed on a regular basis. Hmm. Okay. So a bit how like reg- the way. Well, it's a bit like the way the way super funds, as a, the trustee of a super fund operates. Mm. That's where we we operate in a very similar way in terms of our obligations to yep. our policyholders, and our obligations um, to the regulator. <clears throat> so, I know we we jumped in the bonds. We've gone gone maybe maybe a, a little light for some people, a bit too deep for others. Um, <laughs> How did you get into bonds? What 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 got you into this this world here? <laughs> yeah, it's what, interesting, isn't it? The journey. Well, you you you're not you're looking at um at flames and uh, torches in two thousand with A and P and where yeah. did where did your where did your race continue after that? So um you know I I um I've had a long long career in you know what I would call product. An advisor marketing and mm-hmm. and um, you know product development and um, 
And longer term, I could see that, you know, potentially there'd be restrictions around around what could go in and out of superannuation. Mm-hmm. I think we just talked about, yeah, yeah. you know, the rules always changing and, you know, yeah. almost on an well, annual... Well, you're proven right if that was the case, yeah. <laughs> on an annual basis. Mm. And, and longer term, the whole category of superannuation um, from sitting on the inside of it seemed to be that, you know, it was getting more complex for some consumers mm. um, rather than simpler... And I saw this as a as a great structure to help people uh, either supplement their superannuation, save for a goal, or or an effective way to to transfer their wealth. And you know, there was a great opportunity at Centuria, and mm. they liked me, and I liked them, and mm-hmm. yeah, we've had a we've had great three three and a half years. Oh, so it's been three and a half years. Okay. So, um, so, and in that time, we've seen the super rules change. Yeah, it's like, here you go, Neil. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we've seen the super rules change maybe twice. Yeah. Um, but, but, um, you're, you're rolling around, oh, we don't even need to do any marketing now. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. <laughs> well, we need to tell, but, you know, you talk about these things, and, and often people say, well, how come I didn't know about this? How come I didn't know about this? So I often hear that when I speak to you know groups of advisors or when when our when our BDMs are out there talking to advisors at mm. PD days and things, they may have read a page on it in their Kaplan book or something mm. like that. That's and it. Then, yeah, one paragraph from yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and then they go, "Wow, how come I didn't know about this? This is great." Yeah. And so, um, so you know, I'm making making bonds, bonds. More attractive, mm. just by with your help. Just by the way you look, Neil. <laughs> nah, <laughs> with your help, with the help of. <laughs> hey, it's 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 of interest. Like the main reason we wanted mm. to get you in today is because people were talking about it and advisors were discussing it and wanting to know more. And I think um, I'd be interested to know your thoughts, like going forward. And we could. This is sort of broad, so if, not just bonds, but sort of how. Uh, maybe superannuation, like you were obviously making a few forecasts personally uh, a few years ago. Are you happy to sort of uh, throw a few um, uh, things out there that you think may happen in the next few years? I mean, I think, you know, there's a couple of things that I, I see from more from our clients and from from feedback from advisors that that. Yeah, you know, a lot of people don't want to be told when they can retire mm. by someone else, mm-hmm. and I think that's more a societal thing. So mm-hmm. to say, well, you know, I can get, I can access my money that I've, you know, had to save for, or it's been part of my salary for all these years, and so, you know, I think a lot of people, probably more in in your age group, <laughs> after talking to to yeah. um, to Clayton, uh, you know, that. You know, they don't want to be told by the government when they can retire. Yeah. Yeah, 60s. It's bloody far away. It's <laughs> <laughs> Ten years is much closer. Yeah. Like <laughs> so, 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 yeah, so being able to, to have a savings vehicle that's, that's tax effective that helps you or, you know, you can then nominate ten years prior when you may mm. want to use that nest egg to... You know, have a mature age gap year as, as an example. Mm. Or, or do the golden something. gap year, I've heard The gold. Oh. Yeah, oh. so yeah, a family friend was like, we're going to be going on our golden gap year. And oh. uh, there was talk of like uh, the, um, you know, the big gold wings uh, uh, oh, yeah. motorbikes, <laughs> no. big tourers. Yeah, um, getting a couple of those and just cruising around Australia. I was like, that sounds pretty cool. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, so the golden gap year. That's a, golden gap year. You can put wow. that in some of your marketing collections. Yeah, I've got to use that now. Bring, your, bring forward your golden gap year. That would be. Rather than accessing your super or putting your house on Airbnb while you're away mm. for the for Or the reverse year. mortgaging. Yeah, or, or yeah, <laughs> that kind of, I mean, you know, whatever, whatever you need to do to get your liquidity. But, you know, this is another way that, that you could do it. Um you know, clearly by getting advice, setting a goal, sticking to it, um, and working with a great financial advisor like uh, the ones in the group, group. yeah, yeah, <laughs> to um, to um, to achieve your goal, and of of course using a, a tax paid structure along the way. Yeah, that's uh, 
And I think, like, I guess what you're pointing out is the freedom to, to flex the flexibility. Yeah, and because even along the ten years, you can still pull it out. That's right. So. And I th- and I think that's where, um, you know, if you look at where you know broader societal changes are going, it's all around. You know, I call it flexibility, accessibility, and mm. and you know a degree of freedom. Like, what did what did um, Albert Einstein, I think, said, you know, there's no point remembering something that you can't look up. Well, these days, these days you can Google anything. Yeah, you don't want to remember everything because yeah. it's too much to remember. <laughs> yeah. so, 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 so if you think in now you can access all this information when and whenever you want, mm. you can be on the other side of the world now, you know, you'll be able to fly from Perth to London nonstop. So you can yeah. be... Be you know on the other side of the world in seventeen hours from Australia. So you've got all this freedom and flexibility. Mm. Well, why why do you want to be told by someone when you can retire mm. that you can't access your money? Yeah, I think a, a number of advisors are tr- adopting, I guess, or trying to incorporate the whole um, spending, like enjoying your retirement over time. So things like having gap, mid, gap years or sabbaticals throughout and, and working with clients to facilitate that because uh, I guess traditionally it's been quite binary. Yeah. It's like, well, either you, you're retiring or you're not mm. and that's it. And besides that, you're working. Yeah. And, <laughs> and now, you know, well, there's, what's it called? The gig economy, you know, more people are, are, are doing that. Yeah, um, yeah we use the amount of individual specialists that I bring into components of my business and what we do with XY Advisor, it's phenomenal. Like the process is essentially you just go on, what do you need? You got a problem? What is it? Oh, video editing? Cool. I'll find Upwork, someone. look up, see how they're rated, send them an email or send them a message and um, cool. Per hour rate, specialist and they've already been validated by the rest of that community that's used the outsourcer and you've got a specialist that's done and they could be anywhere in the world. Yeah, it's funny. It's awesome. It's unbelievable, yeah. isn't it? So, if you look at it that way, you think, well, we'll all be potentially working longer in in our gigs, whatever mm. that may be. Um, so, and you, are you guys going to a remote work setup with uh, Centuria? Or is there any work from home going on at all? Yeah, I like coming to the office. You like it? Okay, gets it gets you away from the family for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can get things done. I think if I was at home with the kids. I'd be, you know, there'd be there'd be other activities I'd be tempted to do. Well, this is the thing, actually. Pretty much, there's a direct correlation I've seen with with guys that prefer to be in the office and having a family. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's pretty like just black and white. <laughs> like, you talk to a guy that doesn't have a family, and he's like, "Yeah, I love working home. It's fine. Like, <laughs> yeah, I get more done. I get more done. <laughs> I get more done. Like my situation. And then, um, yeah, every single. Um, Every single person that's um, got a family seems to find it a bit more distracting. Well, I think I'd be sitting, you know, with the kids either, you know, watching Peppa Pig kicking a soccer ball <laughs> around the backyard. <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe a bit of karaoke. Well, I think that implies you're probably, you must be a good dad then, spending time with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, on that note, we've, we've, Probably got to wrap it up because we've been talking for a little bit. It's uh, it's been good to have you on. Been great, thank you, Adrian. And for anyone that wants to check out more, uh, mm. they can go to Centuria's website. And That's right. There's yep. plenty of information there, and they've got and lots of educational stuff, especially when you want to go into exploring the estate planning bits. There's there's a whole lot of um, legally approved uh, documents to read. Yep. <laughs> That's right. And we have lunchtime sessions, so. They get in touch with our BDM so they can come to um, one of our lunch and learn sessions and hear more about it. Yeah, pick up the phone, talk to Alison. She's really cool. She loves it, really passionate about it. So, um, yeah, to, to that, um, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Cheers, Matt. <laughs>